Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the uh, organizers, especially Amanda, for inviting me to the conference. Uh, God knows it's the first time I've gotten out of the house in two and a half years. Um, and I, I use the green button here. Yes. Okay. So a little bit of the background of some of the things I'd like to cover. Uh, the expert committee recommendations around the clinical care, um, looking at emerging payment models, and a couple things I've learned with our collaboration with Pennington, a collaboration within our project with Buffalo, is how to do some of this work in the primary care setting. We have to understand how primary care practices work and their small businesses, and so how healthcare payment change is coming, and then describe some of the studies and strategies, most recently looking at this, the Team Up study, which Amanda and I work on, the PLAN study, which is another one that Dr. Anelli and I work on, very similar type of studies working in primary care, and if y'all thought you had it rough at the beginning of the pandemic with the shortage of toilet paper, that's me on March 9th, right before the pandemic started. I'm right-handed and I had rotator cuff surgery on my right arm. So not only are we running out of toilet paper, I can no longer use my right hand to wipe myself. <laughs> God, I wish I installed a bidet. But seriously, the Monday before the pandemic hit, I had rotator cuff surgery. I'm thinking I'm going to get to watch the NCAA tournament for six weeks on my butt and not do anything. That Friday, Rochester closes down, Monroe County closes down uh, schools, and the next Monday we get a call from NIH program officer saying you're going to have to look at halting recruitment in your studies, both our studies. Um, so I've had some very interesting experiences, which is a whole other five-day seminar talk I can talk about uh, because at the time, I was working part-time in the University of Rochester. I was also working part-time for New York State Department of Health in the Medicaid office, working on childhood uh, Medicaid strategies and payment policies, but they quickly called every doctor who works in the Department of Health and asked us to redeploy and help with other parts of the pandemic. And if you remember, New York was the tip of the spear. Um, so I got called to do a lot of things. Not that I did all of them, I did some. So what can we cover? Um, what can we do now? We're looking at these expert committee recommendations. Amanda um, uh, mentioned these before. So the AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, came out with clinical guidelines in 2006 as a way to think of, all right, at some point we have to treat obesity as a disease. And I think it's something that's really important. We've talked on a little bit here, and, and the other speakers will probably cover some of the more clinical specific aspects. But I want to show you what these guidelines kind of look like. And there will be a test later, so take good notes. Um, the idea is that you assess the problem. We use BMI as our tool to measure, and there, people will argue there's, there's problems with BMI. It's not a great measure, but in a clinical setting with what we have, it's, it's the best thing we have right now. You look at assessing it uh, medical risk, taking a history, family history, medical history, social history of what's going on with a child or adolescent, and then you actually look at offering some type of treatment services. So if a child is normal weight, you just want to make sure they're getting enough sleep, getting a lot of exercise, trying to eat the right things. As weight increases a bit and as they get older, you know, toddler, early school age versus school age or, or adolescent, you have to worry about the severity of obesity more for the medical complications. With that, each level of intervention or treatment would increase. From just the primary care doctor trying to provide some simple strategies to maybe engaging with a dietitian or a behavioral counselor who can help the family with more intensive behavior change to more and more intensive behavior change as we are trying to do with our study, and now to the point of medications and surgery. When I had uh, uh, engaged Amanda and a couple of the other groups about, 2000, about 2014, 2015, I had just finished sabbatical year at my university, create a business plan of how to implement this type of treatment model. At the time, there was one medication approved for adolescents for obesity. Bariatric surgery was just being talked about. We now have at least three medications approved for childhood obesity. Bariatric surgery is an accepted procedure. Uh, large pediatric tertiary care centers are doing cases. I was talking to Dr. Anelli. They do about 20 cases a year. Um, and so we have to acknowledge at some point there is this entity of obesity that is a clinical disease that has to be addressed. But it's not one disease. It has many phenotypes, I'd say. Um, this is a summary of the recommendations from the US Preventive Services Task Force that came out in 2016 that said, actually, when we look at all the research, there, are, there is evidence of what works. And at least 25 hours of contact time, one-on-one, -on -one, multidisciplinary approach for children 6 to 16, or 6 and older, I'm sorry, 6 and older, uh, with obesity. So 
um, that is very specific. It's kind of like intensive mental health behavior counseling, like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or an intensive behavioral model. That's what the focus is. That's where the evidence is. Um, interestingly, before that, there was something called the Affordable Care Act. And within many of the domains of Affordable Care Act, they looked at preventive services. And where was the evidence base? What are good things to do versus things that may not have a lot of evidence? So like colorectal cancer screening or immunizations or things like that. And anything that the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force had reviewed that got a grade A or B the highest grades you can get, um, should be covered according to U.S. Preventive Services Task Force guidelines. Um, and guess what? Childhood obesity received a grade B recommendation. Not only should it be covered, it should be covered without copay. And since that time, it's still been miles to run to get those services actually paid for. We are fortunate, the work I've been doing with Amanda, uh, I want to thank Stuart Gordon who's here, bringing some of the payers to the table of this work to actually get some of the payers to participate in this and actually pay for the delivery of this service. Just like if you have a child with ADHD or anxiety, it's not something that's gonna go away like that. It's going to be there. It's a chronic condition that needs to be addressed and, and looked at in that manner. Um, again, not every kid whose BMI is above 85th percentile or 95th percentile, but for a certain group, it definitely is something that has to be addressed in a medical model that has to occur in a community as well. So I had mentioned before the New York State, uh, I worked for the Department of Health, and MRT is the Medicaid redesign team. In 2014, when I actually did my sabbatical, New York actually rolled out this expansive model to um, deliver Medicaid differently in New York and save money. New York had expanded Medicaid 15 years before that. Some states are still looking to expand Medicaid. So hopefully some of the insights I can bring are things that actually might be coming uh, to different parts of the country if they're looking to expand Medicaid. With this model, they want to look at, all right, let's not just pay for care as it's delivered, or what we call fee-for-service, because fee-for-service is kind of like a factory. The more patients you put through the operating room, the more you get paid, okay? It may not be great value. So what drives costs? And I know you did not come for an economic lecture, so I'll keep it simple. The prevalence of a health condition, the number of episodes of care per condition, so if you have to see your doctor four times a year for your diabetes, or you see your counselor every other week for anxiety, ADHD, something like that. The number and types of healthcare services a person receives. So if you have um, an endocrine cancer, you see an endocrinologist, maybe a surgeon, maybe a radiation oncologist, a hematologist, as well as your primary care doctor. So cancer, renal disease, things can be very expensive. The number and types of processes, devices, drugs delivered. Cancer is a really big one there. And the price for each of those processes, drugs, or devices. So getting a hip replacement can vary in cost at a hospital between maybe $35,000 for the pre-op, the surgery, and the rehab to $150,000. We looked at this in New York, and they found the two biggest drivers of the difference was the post-surgery rehab. So your older patient, your more debilitated patient um, had a longer rehab. The other big cost was the device. Some surgeons put in a stainless steel hip that cost $5,000. Some surgeons insisted putting in a titanium hip that cost $55,000. What the hell's the difference? $45,000, because the outcomes are about the same. And that's the idea of value. So value-based payment looks at these types of models and ways of thinking of healthcare delivery. Um, a lot of things that go into uh, driving payment decisions. Can you bundle payments? Can we actually look at a whole collection of services and put it under one area? How do we negotiate these things? Every hospital or health system has their negotiations with payers of, all right, we want to get a little bit more for our cardiologist, so maybe we won't take as much for our kidney specialist or something like that. Assuring the quality uh, as well as patient safety, which is really important, making sure you're meeting certain standards. You're not doing things that, you know, patients will come in and get something done that you know, maybe doesn't have a high quality value, but they perceive it as such. Like, oh, I wanna get my knee scoped because it feels a little uncomfortable. Okay, but a randomized control trial comparing scoping of knees to good physical therapy exercise program showed the same outcomes at years. So which one's more expensive, physical therapy or a knee scope? Let's answer that one. Um, and aligning incentives through multiple uh, payers. If more payers are at the table, um, you don't necessarily get a monopoly, but you get everyone kind of on a more of a, a level playing field of understanding, okay, this is high quality, we need to really all kind of participate in covering this type of service. At the same time, the delivery system, the doctors, um, the, the health systems will provide the right level of care, appropriate care, uh, not wasteful, as well as uh, 
as, as well as being high quality and safe. Uh, financial rewards to providers actually look at this in a different way. So if you just pay people as doctors to see patients, they'll just keep seeing patients. But if you can look at, okay, how can I address more patients' uh, needs on a broader level? Like how many patients have transportation issues or food insecurity? And looking at that, using my staff or partnering with a community agency to work on that. And I get paid in a bundle, not per patient, not per encounter, but maybe a bundle like a per member per month charge. So I get $5 per member per month for my patients with asthma, and I can use that money to pay for a nurse educator trained in asthma to reach out to the families, to call the families, to make sure they're getting their medications, maybe have them delivered to the home, review how to use their spacers and inhalers, things like that. Things that normally would not be paid for unless they came into the office and you had a face-to-face one-on-one encounter. So part of the redesign plan in New York was to try to create regions. Let's face it, folks, all politics is local. It's good to be here face to face. Same thing with healthcare. And in this model, they divided the state up into regions, mostly where large cities were with large health systems. And in those regions, they had to create a payment system model that all the hospitals had to participate in, all the payers, insurers in those regions had to participate in. <clears throat> so this is just a bigger, a bigger slide of that. This is a slide from the state that wanted to look at how we can bundle payments, thinking of care in, in a few large domains. So on the left, um, integrating physical and behavioral primary care. So a big thing in primary care we see isn't the acute visits, especially in pediatrics. I don't see kids coming in for strep throats or ear infections nearly as much as I did 20 years ago. I see a lot more kids coming in, families bringing kids in for behavioral issues, asthma, chronic conditions, things that don't have that rapid turnover and need services that, as a primary care doctor, I'm not really trained to deliver, but a good family therapist, a good mental health provider will be a key asset to my team. Looking at expensive bundles in terms of episodes of care, so maternity care, a pregnancy through the delivery can be a very expensive uh, uh, process and it can be dangerous for some women. If we're not careful, watching for those who are at high risk, previous hypertension, other health conditions that put them at uh, at risk for complications and the infant for complications uh, at delivery. So how can we provide the safest, the best care and also wrap that in a, a better payment model? Um, stroke care, heart failure exacerbations are similar. And then continuous chronic conditions, things like HIV AIDS, renal transplant, um, uh, severe substance abuse, behavioral health, mental health conditions. Um, and how can we also with those use community resources to, to help those subjects. If they can't get to the doctor, it doesn't matter how good the medicine is or the therapist is. Telemedicine is actually helping us with part of that. I don't want to spend much time on obesity. I'm sure you'll hear more about it. I do want to point out uh, a couple things here. I had said, you know, not every kid, you know, with obesity maybe has a disease. So we use a growth curve, we use 95th percentile. So the kids who are above that fifth percentile and that fifth percentile was created from a reference of US children from the 60s and 70s. You had to start somewhere. So we said, all right, how big were kids back then? And then we created BMI growth curves and said, all right, what percent are at or above the 95th percentile? And it's, increasing, it's increased over the years, as you can imagine. So that top line there in terms of prevalence might be hard to see is for obesity. The second line is for class two obesity. That's 20% above uh, the range of obesity. And this third one is class three or 40% above obesity. That's 2.4% of kids. Go into any community or any region that has a children's hospital that serves kids with medical complications, 2.4% of kids is probably more kids than have type one diabetes, sickle cell disease, cystic fibrosis, all conditions we have treatment referral services for. We don't have anything even for that extreme group of kids, or at least we don't have it paid for. Amanda and, and colleagues, uh, I work with who are here, we're trying to develop those models and get them covered. The only complication I want to throw at you a little bit differently is this, bullying, teasing, weight bias and stigma. We've done a great job in schools looking at bullying, teasing for kids for disabilities, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, their background, not weight. And this is global. This isn't just in school, it's in daycare, it's in the job, it's, it's systemic. And I say it's systemic when you have health systems, hospitals that won't negotiate with payers to pay for obesity delivery treatment systems because they think, oh, it's not really worth it. Obesity is not a disease of lack of willpower or self-control. It's a very complicated condition. 
Um, so where are we now? I'm going to try to touch on a few studies that have actually tried to implement these types of innovations in primary care. Um, <coughs> this is an iteration of that first slide of different stages of treatment on the left. Stage one being something the primary care doc can do. Stage two, stage three involve the physician, but maybe a referral to a subspecialist or partnering maybe with a dietitian, maybe partnering with a children's hospital to deliver more intensive behavioral work, maybe bringing in um, uh, pharmacotherapy in stage four really being the really specialized centers that might actually need to offer surgery, uh, oversee medical therapy, uh, get into more intensive type of work. So looking at stage one or stage two, the American Academy of Pediatrics, through their practice-based network, something called PROS. PROS network is, I can't remember how many, 600 practices, 60, 70,000 pediatricians across America, not working for academic centers. They're working on their own. They're working out of their office and they want to try to do research. And they had originally done research around simple things like chart reviews. As time has evolved, they've gotten into intervention work. This study called BMI Squared looked at uh, pairing a dietitian with a pediatric practice. They trained the dietitians with motivational interviewing over a day and a half, two day workshop. They trained some of the pediatricians over a day and a half workshop. Multiple different cities, communities were involved, but they did it at the AAP national meeting. And the, the team that helped lead the training was using telemedicine to do some of this work using uh, conference calls to train them. And what they're able to show is that they could deliver group one, which was usual care. Group two, where the pediatrician uh, could provide up to four sessions uh, motivational interviewing. And then group three was the pediatrician as well as the dietitian. So not a lot of contact if you think of 10 visits at the most here. Um, and they, in the pilot study, they actually showed it worked, and they actually showed a benefit. And you can look at it a couple ways. You can look at how people were assigned to do it, but what is the real world? The real world is who shows up. So what they showed was the percentile change or decrease in the kids here uh, in group one, it was 1.7. Now the group two was either few visits with the pediatrician or a high number, three or more. And you see those numbers get bigger as you go. So the more they came, the more they attended, the better they did in weight loss. And I would argue, not a very intensive type of intervention when we see evidence showing 25 hours of contact time. This might be eight to 10 hours of contact time done in the primary care setting where a family is comfortable. They didn't get sent to a referral center. They went to their pediatrician's office and did this in the real world. So we've been trying to work on this, um, expanding these types of models. Uh, uh, Amanda and I partnered with the American Academy of Pediatrics and we held a conference um, at the AAP about nine years ago. And with federal funding, we brought in some uh, different community partners to look at these types of models. We interviewed all the stakeholders. So we had people that are representing patients, payers, researchers, so the intensive researchers, as well as the practicing clinicians, doctors who actually try to deliver primary care. Because while the researchers may do a good job, you put them into a, a, an actual intervention site, a, a, a practice, there's a lot of disconnect that goes on there. One of the studies that arose out of it was this one called PLAN. Uh, Dr. Anelli and I work on this. This is a randomized controlled trial done in primary care where we embed a behavioral specialist in the primary care setting. This is much more intensive. We're doing this intervention over two years. These families meet with their therapist, their behavioral coach weekly for four, five, six months maybe, depending on how well they master. And as they master goals and behavior change, then they move on to every other week and then the monthly. So some families in this study over two years may have had 50 contact hours, 60 contact hours. Some may have not, some dropped out very quickly. We were able to track them all because we had consent to look at their medical record. And so we can see where they're actually going. And this doesn't focus on uh, knowledge deficit. I wanna point that out. This is behavior change. So it's looking at things like um, identifying foods in a simple manner and track what you eat. So as opposed to real calorie counting, they use a traffic light diet approach. Some foods are green foods, some are yellow, some are red. How many red foods did you have today? Okay, you can have three to four, you had six. All right, what, what's your trade-off gonna be? How do you set limits as a parent? And the important thing with this intervention is it was the child and the parent. The parent actually had to at least be overweight. Um, and we're tracking outcomes for both. We have a paper out now, and we saw an effect um, for the parent, a beneficial effect for the parent as well as a child. And we saw this effect even during the pandemic. It wasn't as strong as you could imagine, the longer the family was getting intervention during the pandemic, the less effect they had, but we actually still saw that. We hope to hear from a journal very soon about it being accepted or not. Uh, I was hoping I could present that here, but I can't. Um, 
But this is more about behavior change and contracting with parents. And the good thing is when the parents are getting this, they're using these skills around, I don't know, setting limits around when to go to bed, sleep schedules, getting your homework done. So it gets into some behavioral change. Again, it's not the whole answer, but this is where the evidence is. This is where the studies are. But how do you deliver it here? Here's a good example of how do you deliver it. So one of the PhDs from Buffalo, who's been doing this for 35, 40 years, you would argue he's the father of this type of intervention. On a conference call with uh, multiple sites, uh, a question came up about a family. Could we enroll them? And it was a case uh, of a family from, it was actually a family from Rochester. Um, the other team is in Buffalo, a uh, team in Ohio, and a team in St. Louis. And um, our project coordinator said, well, we think we can enroll this family. The dad wants um, his daughter enrolled. The daughter's the right age, meets criteria. Dad meets criteria as well, too. But dad's a truck driver, isn't around a lot. His mother lives with him and mostly takes care of the kids. So grandma wants to do the intervention. Mom's not really in the picture. She's around a little bit, but not much. Uh, and someone said, well, could mom do it? No, dad has actually full custody. They stay with him most of the time but could grandma do the intervention? I'm a primary care pediatrician. Practice I work at is 80% Medicaid, mostly city kids. I was thinking, yeah, no problem. One of the research coordinators who had worked with this physician or worked with this researcher for years had said, well, we need regular families in the study. I said, that is a regular family in my practice. <laughs> Okay, because when you do these studies at the beginning, you want them to be successful, so you do them in the, under the best conditions in the best settings. Doing this implementation size is messy and ugly, but this is how you have to do it. This is what you need to do. Um, we subsequently turned the basis for that project into the team up study that Amanda and I are doing, and we tried to simplify it way down. We got rid of exclusion criteria. We're trying to put, uh, you know, allow more options, kids with mild developmental disabilities, children with mental health problems, not excluding parents. In our original study plan, we excluded parents if they had ever had bariatric surgery. They had, might have had it 15 years before and regained all their weight. That was an exclusion criteria from one of our PhDs. So our team up study, we got rid of that. It's hard to do. Um, this is just a kind of idea around the traffic light diet. We've been really um, successful in getting implementation work around this. One of our collaborators is at Washington University, Dr. Denise Wolfley. Um, her team has been partnering with CDC to continue to expand this in what's called the CORD 3.0 study, and Amanda's team is helping them as well. They're doing this just in Missouri. They're using um, dietitians, I believe, as a primary delivery, but similar type of intervention, uh, fairly intensive. And at the time, they've been partnering, based on the work we started in 2015, with Missouri Medicaid to actually say not only will we train them to do this, but Missouri Medicaid pay for those visits to be done. Um, this is a little bit of data from uh, the CORD study in terms of who they're training, who's involved. So you have intensive interventionists, dietitians, and primary care. The primary care docs have a role. Um, and let's use technology so that can they do online training. This is Dr. Welsh. She's actually one of the, um, one of the trainers. And the modules, you know, it's a very kind of structured scaffolded approach. You build on each session and stuff uh, to do the work. Um, and so he does actually some of the training online. They do role playing. Um, so we train these interventionists and you give them supervision. Something that is actually very common in the mental health field, not something we do in medicine, but you kind of have your, your higher up, your senior person that you go to for support, for backup and examples of how to address this. So with that, we go back to this model from New York State Department of Health of value-based payment. Now we're going to our second wave of our Medicaid implementation. So we've kind of tried to do this, but they didn't really hit on any child health issues in their first waiver. They're going back at it now. What I would like to see is can we actually put in this roadmap ways to put in intensive family-based treatment for kids with severe obesity? Could bariatric surgery for adolescents be part of one of these bundles? Because it's kind of episodic, but there's going to be a chronic nature. And the primary care intervention piece. We actually have an integrated behavioral health team at our practice. We have two PhDs. We have a child psychiatrist who's there two half days a week, as well as a nurse practitioner trained by the psychiatrist. And we have about four or five master's level, either social workers, family therapists, mental health counselors. They are there all the time. They rotate with us. They document our chart. They train our nurses to do behavioral health triage on the phone. Um, they will come into a well child visit and add on and do an additional visit to assess for ADHD and start a mental health workup if needed. So truly, truly integrated. And if they can do this for ADHD or depression or anxiety, I said, couldn't we just train one of them in our scaffolded approach 
and we could hook up families from our practice into it. We're trying to actually try to do that now. So Medicaid 2.0, which is the next waiver, the next New York State application approach, uh, was submitted this summer. They're hoping to get federal approval. And now you're probably like, what the hell are you doing in New York? I don't care about what's happening in New York. These are some of the models, though, the other states that haven't expanded Medicaid are looking at. What we went from was a very hospital-centric model to actually something they call the heroes now, the health equity uh, regional organizations. One of the things that I had wished had come out a little bit better here is that we have multiple stakeholders here, not just hospitals, not just payers. We have over on the right here other stakeholders, task force members, patient population, uh, patient advocacy agencies. We have SDHN, Social Determinant of Health Networks. So what is your safety net network? Maybe the United Way runs it, maybe 211, maybe a resource organization runs that and it has a list of your food banks, of your housing resources, m urgent mental health services, um, childcare support, transportation, things like that. You have MCOs uh, from different uh, managed care plans as well as the providers. Um, and then you have an entity that brings all them together in a geographic region. This is still a hard part that I saw in New York State working in Medicaid that I don't know that they've got around. We have, you know, a state might have half a dozen insurance companies at the table, might have 30 or 40. We have about 25 to 30. Some are very specialty focused. They just work on mental health. Uh, they don't cover all services. Um, but you can't look at, and unfortunately Medicaid plans look at this, look at the delivery of care through the lens of the payer. You really need to look at delivery of care through the lens of the community. And so this is actually a slide from a paper that came out in 2012, but the imagery is actually from the original Folsom port from the 1960s that said healthcare really needs to be a regional, um, as well as other health issues, need to be a regional solution. Just like water quality and safety, air quality, what is your commerce in an area, and you have state lines, county lines, city lines, but you also have these other factors that cross lines. I worked uh, with New York State and I worked with Monroe County Department of Health of doing some of the vaccine work. Well, when you get down to the state level, then you get down to the county levels, all right, well, Monroe County has this team and Livingston County right next door has that. So you do get these political geographic barriers that get in the way. Disease doesn't care. And so healthcare doesn't care either. You spread it out on a geographic area. So this model that New York is planning to run out really is looking to engage our food banks, our housing assistance programs, uh, connecting them to primary care, to the emergency rooms, to our maternity wards, so we can identify stuff at first pregnancy and can we get those mom those right supports during the pregnancy before the baby arises as opposed to waiting till the kid's two month old and mom's at wit's end because all the things that she's got going on. So I wanna conclude there so we have time for, um, most importantly lunch, but for questions. Um, and a couple interesting, uh, slides of some of the work I've done. So as part of redeployment for New York State Department of Health, one of the things I got trained in very extensively was the incident command system model, which is how you run an incident, and a pandemic is a major incident. And it's actually a very efficient way to run a mass vaccination site. So on the left is a picture of the Dome Arena in Rochester, an entertainment venue that we turned into a mass vaccination site that I helped run for about six months. We worked with the National Guard, various state agencies. We had at one point up to 35 vaccinators on tables, six to seven pharmacists doing 2,400 to 2,700 shots a day on 12 hour days, every day of the week, we didn't close, except when we had like evacuations because we had like gas leaks and stuff. Um, so that's a picture on the left. On the right is a smaller outreach team that we went to a community charter school. And yes, if you can see at the bottom, we have a couple dogs there. The Children's Hospital brought the therapy dogs with us when we went to a school. Um, so this is an interesting saying I saw. The 18th century is followed by the 19th century. It's an infectious disease quote. And the 19th century is followed by the 20th, which is now followed by the 19th century. Because if you think about it, we are going backwards. Uh, if you hadn't heard, about two and a half months ago, we had a case of actual paralytic polio in upstate New York. And paralytic polio, I've never seen it. Important thing to know is that polio is, is, a, is a virus that can be spread very easily, doesn't always cause paralytic polio. Actually, the vast majority of the time it doesn't. Probably one in 100, one in 200. So if there's one case of paralytic polio, there may be one to 200 other cases of it in the community somewhere. Unfortunately, it's in a community because of the background and belief of that community, very low vaccination rates in kids and adults of polio. Um, something that should be eradicated in this country, but isn't. So 
Um, thank you, and I'd be happy to take questions.